Today's broadcast is brought to you by Kidum. Kidum is a standards-based platform helping teachers personalize learning. With Kidum, teachers can gain access to an unlimited library of content with beautiful, actionable reports. And the best part is, Kidum is free. Visit them today over at kidum.co to learn more. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. Today, we have a great show. Today, we're talking all about gamification and how you can bring gaming into your classroom. We have two amazing guests, and we're going to get to them in just a short moment here to tell you guys about how you can completely transform your classroom and your curriculum. But first, I want to talk about a great event that happened over the weekend. We had 400 people show up to Ed Camp New Jersey, our fifth annual Ed Camp New Jersey, and it was an absolute amazing time. You can check out all the great stuff over on two different hashtags, over at Ed Camp NJ, or we have a new hashtag that was running around called Why I Ed Camp. It was a great event, gave out a lot of good technology and document cameras, Chromebooks. Want to give a thank you to all the great people that showed up to uh, that day. Um, Check them out again over at the uh, Why I Ed Camp hashtag. Neat things happening this weekend in New Jersey. If you're planning an Ed Camp, we would, of course, love to hear what's happening in your neck of the woods. You can check us out over at TeacherCast. I want to bring on my co-host for the night, Mr. Josh. Josh, how are you today? Welcome back to the show. How are things out in your neck of the woods? Good, good. It's been uh, been a couple weeks. Been uh, been a busy few weeks here, and especially being November, I've been a slave to word count with uh, mm -hmm. NaNoWriMo going on. I caught up on Sunday with a marathon of writing and then promptly fell behind yesterday by not getting my word count in. Uh, we're to the stretch run here. Uh, we only have, what, nine days left. Absolutely. And I have about 16,000 words left to write to reach the 50,000 word goal, but hoping to make it three years in a row. That is fantastic. How, what, what motivation do you have to do this and, and how do you keep going every night? I think part of it is that I post all of my chapters publicly on Medium. So if anybody wants to read some really bad writing, uh, you can head out there and it's freely available for you to check out. And so some people are crazy enough to do that. And that's partly what motivates me is, you know, I have this idea. I share it with some people. They're like, oh, that sounds good. I'm like, hey, you can go read it. So when people are reading, then there's this pressure like, oh, yeah, you can't keep reading because the chapter literally does not exist yet. So I better keep going. Um, so that's part of it. And I think it's just, you know, the whole idea when you set out to do something, you should do it, you know, and it, I feel like it would be cheap if I just backed out at this point because it was getting hard and I was busy. Like I committed to it. We're going to get it done. I totally agree with that. If you are out there and you have a goal, you should set that goal and do it. And I have a couple goals for you guys. There's, of course, several great things that you can do to support this show and all the others over on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. We, of course, love it when you find us on Twitter at TeacherCast or follow our show at TechEdShow. You can email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. Leave me a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. And, of course, subscribe to this and all of our shows over on TeacherCast.net slash audio and TeacherCast.net slash video. We would love to have you as subscribers and check out all the great content happening over at TeacherCast. Josh, talk to us a little bit about our show today, and uh, please introduce our guests. Absolutely. So I'm really excited about this topic, and it's one that I don't know that we've tackled yet on this show. So I'm hoping this becomes... Uh, the first part in uh, many on the subject. Uh, but back when I was in my you know, second year of teaching, which actually wasn't that long ago, uh, I read an article on Kotaku from about some guy in California who started making these boss battles in their games. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I never thought you could do that as a teacher. Uh, and then I tried some things. My principal kind of said, you're overthinking stuff. You shouldn't do this uh, and kind of let it go until I went uh, to Ed Camp Madison in 2013, I want to say. And I overheard a session by a fellow named Michael Matera, who was talking all about how he had done this thing called gamification. Uh, so if you're new to the terminology, the idea behind gamification is that uh, you might think immediately of games like, oh, like that's using Kahoot, or uh, we're going to play Jeopardy today. And that's all like game base learning, so a slightly different term. Gamification means you turn your classroom into a game. 
And uh, I could explain it, but that's why I have guests tonight because I wouldn't do justice. Uh, I have some two great people. So I want to first introduce uh, Michael Matera. Michael, thank you for coming on tonight. No problem. Happy to be here. Uh, I can cross off my bucket list that I made it on the teacher mm -hmm. cast. Uh, yeah, I, and that's uh, awesome. No, I'm, I met Jeff at a uh, conference in D.C. a couple years back, and we got to talking and been watching TeacherCast ever since. So excited to be on it and excited to also be talking about one of my passions, which is gamification and kind of how that can really transform the whole educational experience for both the students as well as the teacher. Excellent. So where can we find out more about you just as we get going here? Where can people start to check you out and see if this guy is legit or not? Fair enough. First of all, I am wearing a tie. So <laughs> legit credibility there. Um, but in all seriousness, you can go to explorelikeapirate.com uh, and there you'd find all information about myself, my speaking that I like to do, professional developments I offer. But also for the teacher, there is plenty of blog posts and resources uh, that you can pick up on the topic. I also wrote a book, Explore Like a Pirate, hence the title of the website. Uh, and then we also have a weekly chat that Tisha is the host of, which is hashtag XPLAP. That happens on Wednesdays right. at 8 Eastern time. Excellent. And that's actually a great segue. We'll talk more about the book later, but definitely don't want to leave Tisha hanging here. Uh, so we want to welcome our other guests to talk about gamification. And um, it's great that she could be here too, because um, I, I think we'll get a good amount of different perspectives on how gamification can look. So welcome to the show, Tisha. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. It's awesome. All right. So where are you uh, signing in from tonight? So I am a culinary arts teacher and discovery school lead at South Medford High School in Medford, Oregon. Well, thank you guys for being here. It is certainly great to have everybody. I, I want to start off with a question here. What is gamification? And, and Mike, how do we start this process? Is this something that's easy to do? Or can we pick this up overnight and maybe, you know, take this with us to our next lesson? Uh, yes and no. So uh, what gamification is, I think like Josh said, it is sort of teasing out the elements that are motivational about games and applying those mechanics to our classroom. So we're not talking about playing a game itself. We're just, we're talking about creating a game or making our experience in the classroom like a game. And where that is something you could do overnight is the fact that a lot of these mechanics could be applied to a lesson or to a, just a small unit. So you guys could literally read the book, read some blog posts and put something together for next week. Uh, easy. Uh, but then also, as I'm sure Tisha will talk about, this becomes transformative for the teacher. Like when you see this put in place and you see your kids lighting up, like the reason we got into education, when you see their kind of endless curiosity and their, their excitement and enthusiasm to come to school and, and literally to, to learn and put together innovative projects, you're going to ask yourself, how can I add more? How can I add more? And that's where it becomes a, you know, a harder endeavor and something that takes a lot more time. Tish, what do you think? Is this something awesome that is easy to do in a, in a classroom? Yeah, absolutely. So I met Michael two years ago at Miami Device, and we were actually in a lunch line, and he started talking about gamification. And I started thinking about how much my students love when I do chopped competitions and I have elements of games in my classroom. And so I went away from that conference and immediately started planning a unit that I gamified. And then that unit turned into an entire um, class period that I gamified. And then that class period turned into all of my culinary two classes. And then slowly, um, within the next year, I had gamified all my classes. So I started out just with one unit, but then that quickly moved into an entire class. And um, 
And it has truly been transformative in my classes. I can't imagine going back to how I taught before. And how did you start this process? So I started by just coming back from this conference that I had gone to and taking some of the elements of game mechanics that Michael had talked about, creating a, a storyline for my class. So in one of my classes, I had developed this theme called Cake Boss. And so that was my theme. I, I took the theme from one of the Food Network TV shows and I started coming up with a storyline for that particular unit. And then I started applying game mechanics to it. And it, my students loved it. They couldn't get enough of it. So I knew after gamifying that unit that I needed to continue gamifying the rest of my units as well. And, and Tisha, awesome. Tisha's a faster study than I was. Um, I gamified one unit, my Greek unit. And every year I do surveys with the students, like, what'd you like? What should I tweak for next year? What should I keep? What should I throw out? Um, and every year the Greek unit came up like, that's the best, that's the best, that's the best. And after about four years of, geez, the Greek unit is always the best. Why don't I just expand when Greek unit was my gamified one? Why don't I expand that out to my whole class? So sadly, it took me a lot longer to realize I should make it the entire experience. Uh, but ever since doing so, like, I can't go back. Um, and when you talk to people that have gamified, that's usually how they talk about it. Like, I can't, I can't picture my class without it. Now, now Josh, I, I would assume it's easy to start something like this in your own classroom or you're in control of the learning space. But as a technology coach or somebody that goes between schools, what do you think about bringing this as a concept into a whole school district? And do you think this would be easy to, to bring into multiple educators, multiple classrooms? I think it's a challenging one for me because I don't have that expertise following me and doing it. I had started it in several of my classes prior to taking the job. So I have some basic experience, but a lot of it is just very much like it was was kind of fun and the kids enjoyed it a little bit more than what I had done before but you know not years and years of this definitely transformed my class because I didn't have that so I don't bring that um, like Michael would to the table so I'm sure he probably has a different experience than me when he goes and presents for schools and he can talk about that so I know he just did an awesome one out actually by Tisha's neck of the woods um, but I, you know for, for me it's always you know, like kind of nudging it here and there and then identifying those teachers that are ready. And so it takes a little more time because it's not one of those things that you day one come in as a tech coach and say, hey, uh, by the way, we're gonna give you all this other stuff you have to do. Like it's identifying the right teachers and figuring out what's gonna work for them and what's the right situation uh, to apply it to. And I, I think, you know, the present company could probably agree it could apply to any situation and eventually it'd be great to get it there. Uh, but as a tech coach perspective, it's about finding the right teachers who are ready to take that on and then letting them be that cheerleader for it and, and show like, hey, this is working. This is having this effect and this effect. That's I mean, that's when technology ideas snowball. That's when this type of thing will snowball. And we've got a couple of teachers kind of on that on that edge this year. Mike, what do you think as, as you're going through doing your, your, your presentations, you're, you're, you're talking about your book? Are, are teachers interested in this or do you feel like you have to do a lot of selling on the concept? Uh, the, like the good example with the workshop I just did, it was an all day workshop. And I asked the room at the start, like how many of you know about gamification already? And no one raised their hand except Tisha. She was in the audience. <laughs> um, and I would say by the end of the first hour, I mean, they were all jotting down notes. They were in. They didn't know how to do it yet, but they they wanted in. And, you know, two more hours in after going through the workshop of kind of like how to structure the start of a game. And we talked about some mechanics and how to build those into your game. Uh, you, you really got a sense where like the room was ready. And the room, by the end of the day, I was super ecstatic to see how many of those people had the full structure of a game pretty much written down and were ready to implement it 
for that next unit. I mean, so when you ask, can people take this away and start it right away? My answer is yes. And that room was filled with people that were science teachers, math teachers, elementary teachers, high school teachers, AP teachers. There were there were there were people that were just teacher aides that were in the room that were they were jotting stuff down and said, "We got to do this." And, and when you say ready, what what does that mean? Is that from a, a curricular standpoint? Is that from a, a, a technology standpoint? What what do you have to have to be ready? Ah, uh, so this is one of the things I love about gamification is it's not just tech. Like you don't, it's it can be low tech, it can be high tech, and it can be no tech. Uh, so really, it, it can be any district. It can be any grade level. So again, you got your little little kids all the way up to your AP classes or your college courses. What it means to be ready in my book was that they understood the how to, how to sort of be the game designer and sort of run the game. I, I assume when I'm doing this that you understand the curricular side of things. Like you're, I'm assuming you come to the table already being a good math teacher, a good science teacher, whatever. I'm here to make you understand the game mechanics around it and how to be kind of a good game designer. So let's delve into that a little bit. So let's pretend that I'm you no know, Joe teacher in seventh grade ELA. And I come to Michael and I say, Michael, I just read your book. It was awesome. I'm still not really sure where to start. Help me out. Where do I begin when it comes to gamifying? I think Tisha already gave you probably the best place to start, and that is always going to be for me theme. Um, to talk, try to try to teach teachers or anybody about gamification devoid of theme, it becomes this very odd conversation. Like if I was just to talk to you about cold mechanics of something like set collection, right? Set collection is like I don't get it. What do you? Why would they be collecting anything in my classroom? I don't understand. It. The moment you sort of apply a theme to it you get it like so if we pick the theme i say okay josh for english language art i don't only do like a robinson crusoe kind of like we're lost on an island shipwrecked okay and how about like every you know third uh crate that washes up they earn something so now they're like looking for crates you know that's part of the theme now what does the crates do in our game maybe the crates could be resource packs that they get to 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 build something for their team, right? So like you're layering these possibilities on top of each other. But again, minus the theme, it's really hard to get started. Uh, when I first started presenting about that, I didn't usually use that as my first statement. And I learned really quick that you have to get teachers or anybody to start thinking of it in context of a theme. And your theme, you don't have to be super creative. I mean, you can start with a pre-existing theme. I mean, take... Take a TV show you like, take a movie you like, a book you like, you know, or one that's popular with your students and use that. I think that's an awesome piece of advice. Um, I know that when I started, that helped me immensely to wrap my head around the theme first and try and figure out then how the rest fit. Um, so... So I also liked how you talked about the TV shows, because if you're just starting, I think that helps a lot with not only the theme, like, okay, like Survivor, like, okay, the theme is you're trying to um, work with these other people with limited resources and um, survive these challenges and then survive the social aspect. Um, so Tisha, you could probably talk a little more about this because you mentioned quite a few different Chopped and <laughs> Kate right. Boss. Well, yeah, my... So you want to like expand upon that? Absolutely. Well, my class fits in great with all of the great cooking shows that are on television. So I've had a couple of different themes going. Currently in my Culinary 2 class, I have a Master Chef theme. And then in my Culinary 3 class, it's a year-long class, so I divide it into two semesters. So one semester is the Amazing Race theme, and the second one is the Great Food Truck Race theme. So an example is with the Food Truck Race, my content is American Regional Cuisine. So what students do is they're creating a food truck name and concept, and they have to pitch that concept to investors that come in. So our staff members come in, and students have their concept made, the food item made, and they have a logo created, and they are pitching this concept, this food truck, to these investors who come in with play money and are um, – 
pay, are paying these food trucks dependent on how well they think they have pitched their concept. And then what students are doing is they are going from Medford, Maine, back to Medford, Oregon in their food trucks, learning about American regional cuisine. So every region that they visit, they have to um, redesign their concepts to match that flavor profile, the cuisine of that particular region. So students then are learning about these, these regions, cuisine, the flavor pro profiles, and then they are, they're recreating this concept. And again, they're setting up their food trucks and then it, investors, customers are coming in and they are um, basically paying the food trucks that they fe feel match the flavor profiles and the cuisine the best. And so they have to have their item. They have to have a presentation that they're giving to explain why their food concept fits to the flavor profile and cuisine of that region. And it is amazing to see the collaboration, the creativity, the problem solving, the critical thinking, all of those things, all of those elements in play in my class have intensified greatly. And my, my class is already a, a collaborative class in nature, but all of those um, skills have greatly increased. And I'm gonna tell you, when students are presenting their food to these customers, I'm like holding back tears because I'm so proud of them. They are so like just empowered and they are so proud of what they've created. And there's been so much, um, so much thought and so much preparation that has gone into this. And it's just really, it's really cool to see. So it's been very fun to um, develop these these games in my classes. And again, my students love it so much. And I, I truly couldn't go back to how I taught before. You know, I, I love that you talk about those things, the engagement, how uh, much more they're invested in these presentations, no pun intended, um, and and just how much more the class is being enjoyed. And those are the types of things that I attach to and that I think are really important in education. But let me be the administrator who's like, okay, this is great. I, I want to bring want to bring Michael and Tisha in to talk to our staff about gamification. But I only have money to either bring them in or bring this guy an assessment in who's going to help us raise our test scores. So can we talk about gamification from that aspect? I know, once again, that's not the most important thing, just trying to be a bit of devil's advocate here. How, how have you seen that side of things, the achievement scores or you know, how much more you um, can see that students are learning? How can you, how does gamification fit in or affect that? All right, so I can say, not that this is PhD research, but uh, <laughs> when I first did, when I first made the switch to gamifying the whole year, uh, by all means, every one of my classes, every one of my units became more challenging, more difficult. Whatever I used to do for them, I don't do. Like I used to let them always have a note card. Now they can't. I used to give them a study guide. I don't. Every, by all measures got harder because I wrapped things into the game. Things became mysteries. Things became things they had to earn. Many kids didn't earn it. So, you know, like just, just the nature of a game. Like some things didn't get discovered, which by definition made the test harder, made the experience harder. I'm teaching sixth grade. Uh, so these are 11 year olds who now don't have a study guide, who don't have these things, right? Every single one of my assessments outperformed previous years. Um, and by and large, that is held true. I mean, now I have fully gamified my class. This is my fifth year. And by and large, I would say that's held true no matter what kind of wave of students you got. You know, you always have like, well, this is a bright group. This is a little like, you know, challenging group, whatever. I have since those five years had, you know, all various waves of students. And again, they excel. And I think it's it comes to this fact where gamification allows us to connect to students in a way we as teachers have not, we fail to connect in the traditional model. Like when, when you bring the guy in on assessment, we are in the business of teaching students, not standards. Like we need... We need to connect to the human side of things. And that's what gamification does. It, it motivates and it inspires students to become the best versions of themselves, reach to improve themselves, to, to do things they didn't think they could do before. That gets a kid to come in the next day. And like, that's the kid that like, 
is going to go somewhere in life. Like the kid that can just make sure he fully, fully fills in the circle. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not what's needed. And not to put down that speaker. I mean, like, I'm sure that he is, he or she is just as passionate about speaking on assessment, but I don't know, by and large, like that is what school is like. And we as educators already have been trained in that. Like you're giving them more of the same, right? Like, you know, like we clearly have a problem right now in schools and your attempt to address it is let's learn more about stuff. Like let's learn more about what we already do. Maybe it's time we start to look at a different way. Um, in my presentations, I often talk about how this is the gamer generation. This is how they think. This is how they act. This is what their mind is constantly doing. And we as educators haven't tapped into it yet. The business world has fully tapped into that. I mean, gamification is prevalent everywhere except education. And that that's an interesting point. Uh, one thing I will say though, is I think education is gamified, but poorly because we use grades. Grades are our experience points, but not uh, not quite in the same way as gamification. Clearly, uh, we see that that's sometimes more motivating than or more demotivating than motivating. So, um, so kind of staying around that topic. Um, I know Michael, you teach in Wisconsin, as do I, but I'm sure it's kind of mirrored across the United States, where teachers are on initiative burnout. They too many things are being added to their plates. And, you know, a lot of teachers will say that, you know, they don't have time for one more thing. I mean, I try and, you know, sometimes offer after school, before school lunch sessions, and even that becomes too much for teachers, even if it's once a month. So when we talk about gamification and we talk about, you know, that's a layer over your game. So by definition, that's going to be a little extra. How do we get past that idea that I, as a teacher, can do no more? but now you want me to do this. And that's great that it's gonna be great for my kids. I just simply don't have time. How do we work around that? Uh, I'm happy to answer it, but I don't know if I wanna give Tisha a chance to say some. Well, I can say from my experience that I have never been so excited to teach before. Like I enjoy coming up with new ideas. I enjoy coming up with new mechanics to bring into my game. And so it's reinvigorated my love for teaching. And I think that that's, I think that is um, something that people don't understand is when you start to come up with these innovative, innovative ways to um, transform your class, like it's contagious, like you can't stop and you want to take the time because you see what a difference it makes for your students. Your students are excited. Your students are passionate. They are um, completely immersed in learning. And so when you see that, you you want to continue to do everything you can for that to continue. Yeah, I would say on that same point, uh, sort of two ways I would answer that. One, uh, I often talk about gamification is adding a layer, a game layer over what you already do. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing with this is unlike some of these other initiative burnouts you're talking about, which typically talk down a little bit to what you do. They're like, you know, what you do that, you stop doing these cute little units, we need to do project-based learning. So throw out everything you did, start new, design project-based learning. Hey, everything you're doing is wrong, you need to do design thinking. Throw out everything you're doing and do design thinking. Like gamification, I'm saying what you're already doing is probably pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Just lay this game layer over top and this way, to be honest, if your district does keep churning out initiative after initiative, the guts of your class can continue to rotate and change and change and change, but you're, you can still have a constant game layer. So this is money in the bank. Like none of this has to go away. For my class, like I said, I've been gamifying for five years. We've had initiatives come through, come through, come through, but I haven't had to change my game layer. Kids are still in the realm of nobles. Kids are still mm -hmm. experiencing these side quests and going on these adventure paths, no matter that they're like, initiative that whips through keeps changing and changing and changing right so I, I would say like stability wise this is a great thing to invest your time mm -hmm. in and then as to add to what tish is saying the second reason is it's just plum awesome i mean mm -hmm. like when your kids come in enthusiastic 
that's why we that is why we got into this we didn't get into this to put ducks in a row we didn't get into this to check off things in a grade book we got into it because we love seeing that light bulb go off in kids and that happens more and more today i mean this is like not academic whatsoever but in one of my courses they're doing in a simulation where they're various countries and the kid is so invested so excited about his country he came up to me he's like miss matera I just ordered on Amazon Italian socks and an Italian tie because I represent the country of Italy. Like, <laughs> like, if that does not make me go home and think, I got a lesson plan. I got to like, I got to think the next great thing for this kid because like, that's what they're doing. Like, they're thinking about ways to amp up class. Right. Like, well, then I got to amp up class. Right. And and I think the beauty too in gamification is that you can start really small and you can continue to build. So you don't have to have the entire thing, this elaborate plan figured out from day one. You know, you start with your theme, you start with your th storyline, you might add one or two mechanics. And so you can keep it as simple as you want. And then as your students start to, um, you know, immerse themselves in this game, then as you see the game develop, then you can keep, continue to add more and more. So start small. Okay. We have a slew of questions, thanks to Peggy there on the chat, uh, who has been diligent. She is awesome. I don't know if either of you follow Peggy George, but you should, because she is amazing. Uh, and I believe she has uh, Classroom 2.0 as a podcast of hers that she does. So she has a bunch of questions for us. So I'm just going to walk through those. Feel free, one or both, answer them. Uh, first one here I want to grab. How much do you involve students in the creation of your games? Uh, for me, I definitely involve them. But I will tell you, it for me, I, I'm a big fan of using mystery as part of my game. So there's a lot that I do keep you know, behind closed doors and just reveal when I want to reveal. But then there's plenty of things that I invite them in on once the once they understand something, right? So once in my game, they can earn a lot of items, these like power-ups and let them do something. And I often encourage them. I say, hey, I have never played my game. I've designed my game. I'm like a pretty good game master to it, but like never played it. So if you're sitting there thinking, ah, gosh, it would be so helpful if that if right there is, is a new item that you could suggest to me. But I don't, I don't see that as a problem or as an impediment. You do because you're a player. So, you know, share that with me. And then after I tell them that, I, I usually get about like 30 new item ideas. Some are awesome, some aren't. But, it, you know, I definitely involve them in that. But, but first I usually reveal something. Like I don't usually open-ended design it with them. Makes sense. Tisha? Kind of the same. I mean, I, I have designed the framework of my game, but there are times in the semester where I'll ask students for feedback. Like, what are some items that you would love to see in this game? And just a couple of weeks ago, I asked them and they, um, some of them had really great ideas that I, I started um, creating right away items for the game. And I think that that's the beauty of it is that you want your kids to buy into this game and get excited. And so when they have a little bit of ownership on, on some of those choices, they love it. Cool. You know, I have to ask this question. I know we have a bunch more, so we'll just keep rolling. Uh, but I can't help but think if I'm a beginning teacher, you talk about play the game and engage in the game. So some of the thoughts I have, and feel free to answer any or none of these, like, okay, what do you mean when you mean by students play the game? Um, other thoughts I have, like, how do students engage with the content in your class? Like some of those pieces, how do students, what, what's a side quest? How do students engage in, in uh, an adventure path? So I know that's a lot of questions, Yeah, but thanks, yeah. those are just some of the things that are popping up in my head. <laughs> uh, like how, how do the students engage in your game? So one thing that like, I think it's a misnomer that at least for me, uh, that a lot of teachers get hung up on is that they think that every moment of my class and every day of my class has some sort of game thing happening. Uh, probably the day-to-day -day experience in my class versus the experience in your class is very similar. I mean, there isn't these game things happening all the time, but it's this engine running in the background that you can constantly tap into, that you can wrap lessons or ideas around. So 
for example, now that my kids are used to gamification, this new unit rolls around, my China unit, and this year, uh, my, my adventure path, which are like optional challenges students can choose to go on, uh, my adventure path for the China unit is basically an independent self-study on China. So here I have 11-year-olds going through the equivalent of like a college online course where I do not teach them anything. They go do module, 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 module. And in the end, they have to take the same test that the other group that got my like hand-holded version have to go do. But then this year, I was just sitting there thinking what, what, and, and there's a project associated with that side of things. And I was thinking, well, I want to, I want to like balance it. I want my kids that aren't on the adventure path to have a project. And again, I instantly think, how can I spice this up with a game mechanic? And they're used to these game mechanics being thrown at them. So what I did was um, those kids are going to have to do like a sales pitch. Uh, they're going to, the, the theme is that they are meeting with the Chinese emperor. We're pretending it's early China and they have to pitch something that actually does happen in China, but they have to pitch it as like something that hasn't happened yet. And we're going to invest in it. Like, Hey, Emperor, this is why you should build a great wall, or this is why we should invent the compass, because it could do this, 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 all real research. But I thought it would be fun if it's not just the Emperor, we need some advisors. So almost like Tisha's game, these kids are going to invest in each other's ideas. And the kids that are on the adventure path, who are doing the self-study course, are going to be my advisors for the kids that aren't on the adventure path. And it was so awesome to see both groups of kids light up. Like the one kids that are doing the project are super excited that these other kids, they're going to get, they have to like literally do a sales pitch on them. They're super excited. The self-study kids are excited that they get to kind of play this role of an advisor. Um, and I would never be able to do that structure and have it have meaning not attached to the game. So like this game, this backdrop, this engine that's running, allows me to push and pull kids in much different ways than I was ever able to uh, without it. But like I said, there's a lot of days that don't have these kind of things happening. Like there are days where it's just regular teaching, you know, or, but you've got this engine you can always tap into. Mm -hmm. I really like that explanation. That clears a lot of things up because in, in my mind, and I've even gone and, and had the opportunity to witness your teaching in your classroom. You know, I get that part of it as you knew coming in some of those cases. So there was something happening, but uh, that that's, I think would really help me if I was a new teacher to think, Oh, good. Like I don't have to have something gamey every single day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, some other questions on here. Um, sorry, I let, Tisha, I totally cut you off. Did you want to say. tap into that at all? Or? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, for example, in my culinary two class, I have a master chef theme and I kind of go unit by unit. So at the beginning of each unit, um, I have the essential questions. I have the competencies that I want my students to learn. And like Michael said earlier, this is a framework that I've layered over my curriculum. So I'm still teaching the same essential questions, the same uh, competencies that I always have. I just have this game layer on top of it. So we, um, I give bakery missions or like my side quests. So within this unit, I launch these bakery missions on Google Classroom. And so students don't have to choose to do them. They can if they want to. But if they do them, then it's going to give them an opportunity to earn XP and these badges that they are collecting. And then they have opportunities within their labs, which I've always had labs in my class, class and a lot of them are the same as they always have, have been. But instead of just doing a lab, students can now earn badges. So if, if a student made the chiffon cake in the cake unit that was absolutely amazing, and I, if I saw the chiffon cake in a bakery display case, I would purchase it. It's that good. Then that whole team might earn a, a badge for product quality that day. Or if a team is this well-oiled machine and they are just super efficient, then they might earn a badge for that. And so they're collecting these badges for different things within the unit. But the overall curriculum that I'm teaching is the same as it's always been. So the, okay. the 
I yeah. Know. So the, the perk of earning these badges is for me is at the end of the unit, if students get to 4,000 XP, they have demonstrated their learning in, in a, a variety of different ways that they have proven to me that they have mastered that content. And then they are actually in my class exempt from that test at the end of the unit. And not only that, but they get a free cooking day. So while everybody else is taking the test, they get to cook. And I'll tell you that every single time a student has reached master chef status and earned test exemption, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they have far exceeded um, and mastered that content um, than anybody else who's actually taking that test and mastering the test. So it has been pretty phenomenal to see what students will do to go above and beyond uh, to earn that status at the end of a unit. Hello everybody, Jeff here from TeacherCast. I want to ask you a very important question. Are you tired with the grade book that your school gives you? Are you tired with the normal ed tech that's happening in your classroom? Are you looking for something a little bit different? something that you can perhaps organize your grades, keep your students together, and really help you create dynamic lessons. I want to introduce you to Kidum, Kidum.co. Kidum provides teachers access to a comprehensive library of standard aligned content from places like the Khan Academy and CK12, Common Lit, and much more. Kidum's analytics are beautiful and actionable. They're student friendly, they update in real time, and they don't look like a traditional spreadsheet. Kidum also helps teachers communicate and they offer support for students in real time with its digital commenting tool. This thing is absolutely amazing. Kidum is pre-populated with academic and social emotional learning standards, including Common Core and state-specific standards. You can even add and track your own standards. Kidum wants to help teachers spend less time finding and assigning work and instead commit more time to developing and exceeding authentic learning experiences based on students' needs and strengths. I urge you guys, check out Kidum over at kidum.co and you can also find them at teachercast.net slash kidum. That's K-I-D-D-O-M. That is fantastic. Um, and this question kind of ties in and, and can be kind of a two-parter tied to both of you. So, Michael, you talked a little bit about how your achievement improved or those test scores improved in your class because of it. Um, and, and so my question to both of you would be, um, if you have perceived or have a measured improvement in scores, how much uh, is, could you attribute that to the gamification or how, how, how do you really tie that improvement to it? And then kind of to piggyback off of that, is there anywhere where either of you have written about, you know, these effects that you've seen? Uh, okay. So the, how I can tie it to it, like I said, it, not that it was like PhD research. So these are all going to be sort of anecdotal, but, um, I feel like I can pretty certainly attribute it to the game when you put in motion, like Tisha said, something that forces students to I shouldn't even say force. They naturally choose to be more collaborative. Like now in the game, they're the person next to them, their their abilities in class directly impact you. And they they impact like our ability to move through this game experience. Um, there ends up being this almost sports team bond that takes place in our classroom that we used to just sort of leave off to the football field. Uh, so, for example, kids will now, I'll, I'll go out to recess and there'll be packs of kids studying for social studies quizzes and tests around, you know, around the playground. Uh, that didn't happen previous to, to gamification. So, um, I guess, I think students of all ages want to be part of something. They want to... They want to do something epic, right? And like, as you point out, Josh, school itself, just itself, the raw version of school isn't inspiring. It's a, it's a poorly designed game. So, you know, left to its own devices, I think you're just going to get kind of a blah, passe effort out, out of the whole student body. I mean, obviously we can all cite that we have this kid that's an A student and is great, but the the average student body, I think is just gonna, you know, put in a moderate amount of effort and they'll be okay with the results they get. 
I think gamification inspires people to bring their full capabilities to the table. Excellent. Absolutely. And Some I would just kind of response issue, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. I just I feel that since I've started gamifying my classes, students are just so much more immersed. They're so much more excited. They're I mean, they're running into the class wondering what we're going to be doing today. They, um, the attendance is better than it's ever been because they're counting on each other. They're working together in this collaborative nature within my classes where they count on each other and they all know that they're a very vital part of our class. And so they want to be a part of that. Like Michael says, they want to be part of something epic. And so I have found that, um, kids are just so much more hungry for the knowledge and they're just so much more excited to, to learn the content. And they are challenging themselves at a higher level than they have before, where they might've just been kind of um, indifferent towards learning the content. Now they, they wanna go above and beyond. They wanna challenge themselves um, at a higher level than they had previously. Awesome, and you know, as you talk about this, and uh, let's see how good my segue is here. Um, all I can think about is is teach like a pirate and reading that for the first time. And you know the idea that if I have students who are not motivated in my classroom, and if I have students who maybe act out in my classroom, I have a lot more control over that than I think. And it's not just I need a better behavior system. Uh, sometimes it's I need a better engagement system and not that that's going to fix all that ails but from what I'm hearing that's kind of what you're seeing you know the students are are into the content more and if the student is more into the what's happening in class I think there's less likely a chance that they're going to want to try and get out of the class uh, which is what acting out is so you know when I think about those connections it's no surprise that of course Michael you were able to write a book that's part of the teach like a pirate family um, so can you talk a little bit about Explore Like a Pirate, uh, kind of what people would expect if they were to, to read this book and um, why, why you felt that it was time to write it? Uh, so the book, uh, Dave had seen me speak several times and just sort of encouraged me to write it. He said, I, you know, you have to write the book. You got to Put out the sort of manifesto of gamification because uh, it, truthfully it was needed in the space. Um, though a lot of people that start gamifying without sort of hearing explore like a pirate message sometimes fall into the sort of the window dressing of uh, gamification. You know they think only about points and badges and my game has points and badges and so does Tisha but if you stop there that that really, that's really the, the low hanging fruit of gamification. You're not going to really get into the meat, the good things of game, gamification, the collaborative experience, the, the truly transformative things that Tisha and I are talking about. So when I saw that, and when I would go to ed camps and speak without the book, or when I would go to, to different, you know, conferences and speak without the book, it was just clear to me that most people left and just Hey, I, I, I started giving out the microscope badge and the like helpful hand badge. And you know, my kids cared for about a week and they stopped. Well, that's cause like, you're just, you're, you're just pasting it on. Like, and that, that's not going to be much more motivating than the grades we already have and the points we already have. Like there, there is an intentional process that you have to sort of go through and create uh, to, to, to have that sort of transformative experience. So a book was needed. Um, when I sat down to write the book, I made like a promise to myself, I wasn't going to reduce it to that, that I was going to make sure that that got fully communicated, that we're talking about so much more than just points and badges. So the first third of the book talks about gamification, what it is, why we should do it. It talks about the language I use in the classroom. Um, a lot of people write about how that was a surprise in the book, you know, that they were just thinking it was going to be about points and badges. And here they're talking about purpose driven learning and this, this action oriented vocabulary you can use with your students to to really, truly inspire some sort of greatness out of them. And then the back two thirds of the book is all practical. That was the other promise I made with myself. I hate books that sell you on the idea 
you know, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. You should be doing this, but never tell you how to do it. And you get to the end of the book, you keep reading thinking they're going to tell me, they're going to tell me how to do it. And they never do. The back two thirds is filled with many games you can play in your classroom that you could take away right away and use tomorrow. It's filled with mechanics that you could apply to your game, big or small. It includes like a full workshop model that you could walk through yourself and eventually build out your entire gamified course if you wanted. So I feel like I jam packed that thing with as much love and attention as I could to truly answer sort of the teach like a pirate message. Like I really view explore like a pirate as a perfect companion. Like Dave's teaching you about bringing your passion, bringing your excitement and that the sky's the limit, but he doesn't necessarily always tell you the way to do it. And I think that's genius of his book because the answer is in with it within all of us. Like it's what's passionate for you. But I, I also think some of us need some like concrete, like how could, what would inspire students? And I think I put a lot of that in the book. Again, this is the gamer generation. So um, I love this week, somebody put up on Amazon a review and they said that the Explore Like a Pirate is their new teaching Bible. Like they have it at their side, at the ready, at all times. Like it's just filled with tons of ideas. And she just keeps going back and pulling out more ideas and applying more ideas. And I mean, that what a, what a compliment that was. I mean, that was an honor to get that. But I, I, I guess without sounding too self-serving, I really think everybody, there's something in there for everyone. I don't care if you're a year away from retirement or this is your first year. I don't care if you teach kindergarten or 12th grade AP physics. Like, So, Mike, people might be out there listening to this saying, how can I get a copy of the book? And uh, you are prepared to, to, to allow somebody to partake in that one. Is there a good way or a great way that we can uh, offer somebody here listening a, a, a complimentary copy of one of your books? Uh, so one way that I would like to, uh, run a sort of contest here is if in the next two weeks, somebody, uh, signs up for my newsletter on explore like I, I will pick two random winners for, from anyone that is new to signing up on explore like a newsletter. And that'll obviously automatically pop up. Uh, that's two that'll come from that way. That is pretty awesome. So let's say between uh, now, which is uh, the week of Thanksgiving and December 1st, if you go over to explore like a pirate.com, sign up for Mike's newsletter. Uh, you have a chance to win one of two great copies of this book. Um, definitely check it out and, uh, and definitely it, get on his and newsletter. It doesn't stop there though. It doesn't stop there. What do you mean, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> also on Explore Like a Pirate, I have a couple other digital products that are really helpful for teachers. There's a leaderboard that like has it all laid out for you. Like so you can have as many groups as you want. You it'll like balance the scores out between the groups. It'll have leaderboards easy to post. All this. Um, same thing. I'll pick a winner for that. Sign it up for the newsletter. And then also there is a uh, mini game that I just put out called mystery box and it is awesome. And so many flexible ways that you can use this. Uh, I will also give one of those away. And if you want to go out and check explore like a pirate.com and check the shop section, you can read what all those are. Uh, and like I said, that'll be another one I give away. And so Josh, what a great topic here on this Thanksgiving weekend, learning how to explore like a pirate. I want to know, when are we going to do cooking like a pirate, Tish? <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I would love to write that book. They might be Out there, Dave. Dave, are you listening? D Dave, are you listening? <laughs> com. Josh, you know, it, it's topics like this that really do come from our listeners. I mean, getting out there and seeing what's going on in the classrooms, hearing some of the things, reading all the different chats going on on Twitter. It, it's topics like this, which we really do love the audience that happens here on TeacherCast. So I want to just say, you know, as we're going into our Thanksgiving season here, how thankful I am and how thankful we are here as a show to have everybody on the program and, to, you know, listening and stuff. There are a few great ways that you guys out there can say thank you. 
you. One of them is by following us online and subscribing to this very show. Of course, you can do that on TeacherCast by going to at TeacherCast. Our Twitter for this show is at TechEdShow. Email us over at feedback at TeacherCast.net. Request some shows, request some topics, request to be on the show. We'd love to work with you. And, of course, you can subscribe to this audio and video show over on TeacherCast.net slash audio and TeacherCast.net slash video, which takes you to our iTunes and our YouTube pages. Um, so thank you so much for supporting the show. Josh, um, I'll let you do uh, a, a final run-through with everybody. Where can we go to find out about our guests? Uh, Tish, let's start with you. You can find me at, at Tish Rich on Twitter, and love for you to join in to our Explore Like a Pirate book chat on Wednesday nights at 8 Eastern time. We are going to be taking this week off for Thanksgiving, but we are going to be back strong next week. I believe that is 11 29 next Wednesday or 30th. Next Wednesday. 30th. 30th yeah. next Wednesday. Where you can still sign up to get a copy of the book if you uh, do the newsletter, right, Mike? That's right. Uh, and you can find me at explorelikeapirate.com. And my Twitter handle is at Mr. Matera. And you can definitely see lots of posts by all of us on hashtag XPLAP. And thank you guys so much for coming on the show today. And please, please, please book yourself on the show to return to talk about the brand new book, Culinary Like a Pirate. Josh, <laughs> talk to us a little bit about where we can get a hold of you and uh, find, follow you on your social networks. Uh, probably the best place to see what I'm up to is at Mr. G Fact of the Day on Twitter. Uh, if you want to read some uh, pretty solidly okay amateur writing, uh, I post. You'll see me tweeting out all of the chapters. I actually write those on Medium.com. Uh, so uh, that's some of the stuff you can see out there. We're also currently working on uh, getting TEDx going again for uh, May of 2017 at the middle school in De Pere. And we are looking at reconfiguring our Fired Up for February personalized PD challenge. So uh, these are all things I will be tweeting about, uh, not to mention the usual um, inane things like puns and uh, Wisconsin sports. <laughs> Check out all that great stuff that's happening. And, of course, there's several great things happening this week all over on TeacherCast. Check us out over on TeacherCast.net. Lots of great things. And don't forget to uh, check out our YouTube channel. We are almost at almost at uh, 6,600 subscribers over there on YouTube. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, both Sam and I are working on some pretty cool projects. And uh, just to speak a little bit for what Sam's doing, check him out over there on puppetstelljokes.com. He's doing some pretty pretty neat things. Uh, we're going to be publishing some of his puppets and his joke telling over on TeacherCast on Thursday mornings. Um, so every Wednesday, Sam puts stuff out. We're going to be supporting all the great work that he's doing. On behalf of everybody here on the Tech Educator Podcast and the TeacherCast Educational Broadcast, Broadcasting Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, encouraging, encouraging you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.